Good evening, everyone. I am proud to welcome you to the Fall 2021 Leadership Lecture Series. And for many years, Book Passage, which is San Francisco's Bay Area Prize Independent Bookstore, has partnered with Dominican University of California. In fact, tonight is the 141st lecture we've done together over many, many years of leading change leading authors to our campus and to our community. So thank you, Bill and Elaine. Elaine Petrucelli is the president of Book Passage. Thank you, Elaine and Bill, for building our community. Your bookstore is really a community center that we, we really appreciate. For 45 years, it's been a gem in our town. So Elaine, Elaine will join us later uh, at the culmination of the program, and she'll make some closing remarks. Tonight's lecture is sponsored by the Bank of Marin. For 30 years, Bank of Marin has been a leading business and community bank in Northern California. They have grown assets through local relationship building and four strategic acquisitions. Today, Bank of Marino operates in 10 counties now with 31 branches across the Bay Area, Greater Sacramento, and Amador County. Thank you, Bank of Marin, for your continued support. Our distinguished speaker tonight is Lydia Bastianich. She is the author of 15 previous cookbooks and the Emmy Award winning host of public television's Lydia's Kitchen which is also airs internationally. She's also a judge on the Junior Master Chef Italy and Italy's highly rated daily program called La Prova del Cucoco. Lydia owns Cuoco. Beppo. Say again, Lydia. La Prova del Cuoco. Yes, that's what I meant. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Thank you. Lydia owns Becco and several other restaurants and is a partner in the acclaimed Eat Ali. Tonight, Lydia will be in conversation with Noah Galutin, a chef, a restaurant consultant, and a James Beard Award nominated cookbook author. He helped launch the beloved Los Angeles restaurants like Bloodsoe's Bar and Q, Kofax Coffee, Prime Pizza, and Yojimbo. Noah co authored On Vegetables with Jeremy Fox, as well as the upcoming Bloodsoe's Barbecue Cookbook. His debut solo cookbook is called The Don't Panic Pantry Cookbook. It's coming out this year. So please join us in welcoming Lydia Bastianich and Noah Galutin. Lydia, thank you so much uh, for uh, uh, having me here today. And thank you to Elaine and Denise. Um, and first of all, Lydia, I just want to say on a personal note that I uh, grew up watching your shows with my mom and your cookbooks were on our shelves. And this is a very uh, exciting and fun thing for me. And my mom is is uh, at home watching. So it's a uh, very full circle and exciting. Well, my pleasure. I think Lydia broke it. Like and Denise, it's a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to the conversation. Me too. So the we're here obviously talking about this book, your new book. Uh, Lydia is a pot, a pan, and a bowl. And this is, is it true? This is your 15th cookbook, is that right? Well, no, uh, it's I have this is my 12th cookbook, and then I have a memoir. And then I have three uh, children's books. So well, we're gonna in total, it's a big one. number, but it's uh, uh, my cookbook. So one of the things that uh, stands out, because you've written so many amazing books, um, and I've, I have many of them right over there on my bookshelf. Um, one of the things that stands about this book is it's, uh, it's really focused on like simple streamlined processes with uh, minimal cookware uh, appliances, minimal pots and pans. And it's also, it's not a thick book, but there are a lot of recipes in it, which is really as a recipe writer and a cookbook author speaks to you really getting down to like the accessible basics of how to make food at home. Um, and can you talk about sort of why that was important to you for this book and how that all sort of came about? Well, Noah, you know, the importance of being a chef, a cookbook writer is ultimately that you transport that desire, that knowledge, that actually how to, to cook at home and make a recipe. So in order to do that, you know, we are professional chefs, but also I started in a sense 
cooking with grandma, simple, at home. And, you know, in retro, uh, a book takes about two years, a cookbook for me to make. And so when I started, it was before the pandemic, but the pandemic came and evermore this made so much sense. I went back and I said, you know, when I cook at home, when I remember what my mother did, my grandmother did, it was usually one pot, two pots. There weren't 10 pots on the, on the stove. Uh, and this, it was sort of a buildup of, of, uh, of a meal. And uh, that pot or pan or bowl uh, contained, at the end, when it was ready, proteins, vegetables, legumes, soup form, braising forms, salad forms. There was a balance, almost a whole complete meal within one vessel. And I said, well, this is the way to cook. Of course, not all of the recipes can be cooked that way. But I, as you notice, you know, I selected and I used the recipes that are the best, the easiest, and that really give you great results uh, taste-wise, nutritional-wise, and are part of the Italian culinary tradition. Yeah, as you say that, I was reading through uh, another one of your books, uh, this one, uh, which is your memoir, My uh, American Dream. Uh -huh. I was reading right. about the parts um, when you were in your home with your mother cooking, and you were talking about stuff that was coming up so often in your new cookbook, talking about, you know, smoked ham hocks and uh, sauerkraut and things like that that you'd get from the grocery store. And <laughs> In a way, it feels like it kind of like you were saying, like it was almost like uh, sort of after all these cookbooks and all these restaurants to be able to transport back to what it was like to cook in a small <laughs> apartment again. And it's like such a kind of a touching full circle thing to see those two things coming together. Well, well, Noah, you, you, you know that I am a traditionalist in the kitchen. I do not invent. Uh, you know, I transport the Italian, my native culture, to my adaptive culture. You know, that's my great satisfaction to be able to share with the country that took us in. I was 12 years old when I came as an immigrant that gave us this great opportunity and that I feel so much part of. But at the same time, I feel very Italian. And I wanted to bring the two, my two families together, shall we say. So being a traditionalist, that's the way in Italy you cook. That's the way a mother, uh, a grandmother cooks at home. And when you're talking about, you know, going to my memoir, uh, Lydia's American Dream, and going back to those memories, I grew up in that setting, in the setting with grandma. And uh, uh, she, she produced most of the food that we ate, you know, of course, fresh seasonally, but also the dry beans. We, she fermented uh, cabbage, whole cat. So that was sauerkraut. We had two pigs every year. We had goats, we had chickens, we had rabbit. But the two pigs in November, uh, and there's a passage of the slaughter actually in that book because I really related to that. You know, those hawks, those ham hawks, they, she smoked them. They were hanging in the cellar. And so she would make, those were really real things for me, things that I was involved. And then to go back and to be able to share and you know with the public today to go retro in a sense to really go forward to cook the way uh it's the tradition is simple delicious seasonal and very respected respective of nutrition but also respective of the environment yeah i was so taken by the section in which you talked about uh going to uh I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the town now, to Busolar. Is that where it was? Busolar, Busolar, <laughs> yes. Good. And uh, visiting uh, with your grandmother. So the idea, and you think about it, and we have all these, you know, chefs talk about, you know, nose to tail eating and all these things that people are discovering different cuts of meat that they like, but to read about it in the real context of, of uh, your grandparents would buy two suckling pigs, they'd raise them, and when they were at the right age, the butcher comes and slaughters them, and you you know, now we sort of romanticize the guanciale and the prosciutto and all these different parts, but in the reality is you realize that it was all necessity because that was your food for the year and how to break all that down and use every part of it, even to make a <laughs> soccer ball. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, yes, uh, you read the book thoroughly. Uh, yes, that's you know that was my 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 uh, upbringing. Let me sort of just go a little bit down in the history. Where is this taking place? I was born in East Asia. East Asia is a little peninsula that is now part of Croatia. So if you're looking from Venice, there's you you just cross the Adriatic, a little sort of gulf, and you come to East Asia. East Asia. Uh, after World War II, Istria was Italian, we were Italian, but after World War II, Italy lost the war, and as part of the spoils of the war in the peace treaty, that part of Italy was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. So in my formative years, uh, the, the regime was communist, even though we were Italian, food was not all that available, and all of these sort of uh, growing everything, drying the beans, drying the figs, uh, uh, pickling uh, the the the, uh, the pickles, the sauerkraut, fermenting the sauerkraut. All this, I grew with this. I grew up with this. Grandma needed to make this because that was what was feeding the whole family. So, you know, talking about the pig, I remember the whole ritual so vividly, you know, when it was time and the slaughter and the butchers came and, uh, you know, ultimately my grandma is running with a, with a, with a bowl to catch the blood so not one drop of blood would be wasted. And we would go right in the kitchen and make uh, blood sausages. And I remember mixing that, you know, with raisins in them, with dried figs in them. So, you know, you, 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 that's, that's in me and I, I have to share it. And uh, for me, Guanciale, as you say, is hanging in my grandmother's cantina, if you will. It's not some wonderful world, word that I just learned. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually reading about that time too was so fascinating of the idea of being from a country and it's suddenly no longer being that country anymore. And because your mother was pregnant with you that she couldn't leave and all of a sudden your last name yeah. changed, the street names changed. Uh, it becomes you being forced to teach in a different language. I mean, uh, that's, and, and now what, and how, what it must be like to go back to visit there now in that contrast. Uh, I, I go back and it's Croatia and I still, the house where my grandmother was is there. It has loosened up its democracy now. But, you know, I can't help by thinking of what's going on in the world and these wars and these borders and this and that. I was part of that in, at the end of the Second World War. So it is a time that's difficult for families because my, my parents ultimately decided that they could no longer live under communism. We escaped back into Italy. Uh, and that was in 1956. When we got to Italy, of course, our papers, our names were changed. We ended up in a refugee camp. And for two years, we were in a refugee camp. We're sort of, you know, you were, I was online for food. So my connection with food uh, has many different facets, but at the end, it really makes me appreciate, respect, and uh, share this gift that we have, uh, that the earth gives us, and that we make this great food. So on the contrast of that, while you are a big traditionalist, you talked about um, when you first were given the bag of food in America and your mom thought that Crisco was floor wax uh, because she couldn't figure out what it was. <laughs> And you also reveled in the amazingness of like a Duncan Hines, like a packaged cake that you just pour in the ingredients and it makes cake. Are there oh, any no. like Americana ingredients that you still secretly enjoy that you can't really, that you don't necessarily you know, uh, talk about anymore? You know, no, uh, when we ultimately in 1958 came as immigrant uh, immigrants, we were brought here by the Catholic Relief Services and the Red Cross. And we had nobody here. So they set up a little home, found a job for my father. So everything was new. But I was 12 years old. My brother was 14. We were so excited and so anxious. First of all, see New York. We came into New York. Uh, and, and this new world, we wanted to be Americans now, you know, because coming from a camp and all of that. And uh, uh, the food also, this whole new uh, world, going to, to a store, uh, a grocer, a regular shopping center, the store, food store, for us was amazing. Aisles and aisles of food. And uh, certainly some of uh, the things that really intrigued us, 
my mother used to buy chicken wings and chicken eggs, and that because they were they were cheap. They made a good soup. We made we ate uh, rice and soup, and then we sort of gnawed on the on the on the wings and on the necks, and that was good. But you know, we were curious. I was curious, and one of the things Noah that really uh, uh, I began to sort of explore is this prepackaged cakes. You know, these cakes. You know. All you have to add is an egg and some butter or some milk, put it in the oven, and voila, you have this wonderful cake. I couldn't get enough. We had dessert every single night because I was just mesmerized, you know. I remember with Grandma, baking was a procedure. And here it was, instant. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, peanut butter and jelly. I still, I never had that combination before. You know, we don't have like that much peanuts, especially peanut uh, uh, butter in, in, in Italy or, or what was Yugoslavia. So that also fascinated, uh, fascinated me. And you know what else uh, uh, you're going to think? It's uh, spam, you know, spam the meat in the can. Yeah. I thought it was delicious. <laughs> All of these things. So, yeah, it was, uh, you know, discovery of a new world. Does any of that stuff make it into your kitchen these days? Well, I'm peanut butter and jelly. I enjoy it now and then. Absolutely. You know, and I had kids and grandkids. And so, so they, so on, they did. I enjoy a great hamburger, you know, a cheeseburger. Absolutely. You know, uh, as, uh, as everybody else. So, so yes, yes. You know, there's uh, some Americana. I have barbecue sauce in my refrigerator. I have ketchup in my refrigerator. <laughs> Yeah, ketchup's one of those ingredients that you're better off entrusting the mechanical process versus trying to make it at home. Right, right. Um, well, speaking of things you stock in your pantry, so this is, uh, I'm I'm very excited that I uh, have my first cookbook, my first solo cookbook coming out with Knopf, who's your publisher as well, coming out next year, and it's uh, called Don't Panic Pantry, and it focuses on, a lot of it is inspiration of my Italian grandmother who taught me that you should always be able to uh, in a pinch, have enough food in your pantry to cook for 12 people who showed up out of the blue. And uh, as a result, I was wondering, what are some of the uh, pantry staples for you that are really important to have on hand that sort of make sure that you're set up for success uh, at a moment's notice? Well, first, congratulations, Noah, oh, on you. your book. Uh, I look forward to it. Make sure uh, that you advise me when it comes out. Absolutely. Uh, the pantry, yes. Yes, the pantry, you know, first of all, dry pasta has to be in there, but olive oil, uh, anchovies, some tuna, tomatoes, uh, olives, uh, uh, roasted peppers, even beans. You know, beans in a can are perfectly good and perf perfectly fine. Uh, and uh, the basics, you know, garlic and, and onion. Uh, and once you have that, you know, some breadcrumbs around, uh, some cheese around, you can make uh, at least right off the bat with the ingredients that are 10 different pasta dishes. And, you know, pasta with uh, a pound of pasta, you go a long way with feeding people. Well, speaking of beans and lentils and things like that, getting back to your new book, there is a lot of a sort of this one pot meal element to it that has all these nutritional benefits to it and the importance of fiber in a diet and all these things. And uh, can you speak a little bit about kind of the, the nutritional elements that sort of find their way into these delicious one pot meals that are kind of a complete meal that when you make them? Yeah, you know, ever more as we look back, uh, we're going forward, but we are looking back to see what it was. And we find, especially in the Mediterranean diet, that this balance between uh, the condiments, the legumes, the vegetables, uh, the uh, minimal proteins, proteins are not a big, big, uh, uh, but the vegetables and the latticini, whether it's cheese or whatever, this balance, this, this sort of food categories you can make you a soup, can make you pasta dishes, can make you uh, sort of stews or braising, all of that uh, in different uh, uh, combinations. Uh, I think uh, what's important in one part cooking is to understand the timing of the cooking of each ingredient that you add on. Since it is a process of addition, 
you know, timing is important. What takes the longest goes in first. That doesn't mean, you know, if uh, you, you do in a stew, uh, uh, you, the, the beef or the pork, whatever, or lamb, or whatever you're doing, you braise that first in the pan. You take that out, and then you begin to make your, your sauce in the, with the onions, with the garlic, and then goes the meat back in there. And, of course, if you're going to add carrots, then the carrots. If you're going to add chickpeas, if you soak them before, uh, then they're going to need some for just like the meat, about the same time as the meat. So they should go in with the meat. If you're using canned chickpeas, then you have to wait until the end. So it's understanding as a cook what takes how long to cook and how do I make this crescendo in this one part of, of a meal that ultimately will taste delicious, will be nutritionally sound, and also it'll have texture, the right texture for every ingredient. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> well, we've got Thanksgiving coming up. Um, and uh, in general, I wanted to ask you about entertaining for large groups. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to know, this is a, a personal question, is it's the thing that I'm trying to learn how to get better at is when you're cooking for a big family event, you know, how do you decide, how are you at delegating? How much do you trust different people to be involved? Do they have to earn the right? I'm very bad at that. And I just end up wanting to do it all myself. Sometimes I'm learning to get better, but how do you obviously figure out who's allowed to help you and what Noah. you're allowed to do? <laughs> No, I'm somewhat like you, you know. First of all, uh, let's say Thanksgiving is coming up. And uh, I love Thanksgiving because all of the other holidays, uh, they turn out to be Italian holidays at our home because that's what we are. But Thanksgiving, I really respect the tradition. And it's one way for our family, now my children are born in America, my grandchildren are born in America, uh, for us to really thank and respect uh, the country that has given us these opportunities. So there's the traditional turkey, there is the sweet potatoes, there's the pumpkin pie, uh, there is, uh, uh, um, I do add, there's the apple pie, but I do make a little apple strudel. I do glaze my turkey with a little balsamic vinegar. So, you know, it, it really it becomes beautiful. So I do a, some Italian touches, but uh, uh, it's traditional uh, uh, American fare. And I, I love doing it. Um, my daughter likes to make the stuffing. My daughter-in-law makes the cranberry uh, chutney or the cranberry, she does a cranberry and orange. So they have their specialty that they bring to the table. But, you know, I take it on. I love it. It's, it's what I do. Uh, and it's my family and it's a great holiday. Then they can wash the dishes. That I let them do. I'll tell that to my, my mother-in-law who's watching now. I'll say, don't help me in the kitchen. You can just do the dishes after. <laughs> well, I probably <laughs> shouldn't do that either. Um, <laughs> Well, here's another thing I think about with entertaining, and uh, I sometimes go too far in the wrong direction with it, but I'm, you're spending so much time cooking all this food, and then you end up sometimes putting out so many meats and cheeses and crackers that by the time dinner comes along, everyone's full, and they're not wanting to eat the food you spent three days making. How do you, uh, <laughs> how do you decide the balance of how much food to put out before dinner? Well, I, I know, you know, we already talked what each one wants. I have three kids away at college, three grandchildren, and uh, two are at work. One is on the West Coast. And I already know what each one wants. So I want to make sure that I have enough of that. But I try to balance, you know, and not overdo it. We're all guilty, you know, we want to do this, we want to do that. And then at the end, when you have leftovers, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's not pleasant in a sense. But, you know, the question is in recuperating everything. I always make a big stock out of the carcasses and all of that, a soup. That's the next day. Reheat absolutely the turkey with that. So we recycle, you know, it's good. Uh, the next day, usually family stays over and uh, or I send them home with some. So I try not to overload the meal, a nice antipasto. Then usually, you know what I do, a, a good uh, 
stock, a good, I make it with capon, a good capon stock with tortellini, a little bit of pasta got to be there. And so, and take the time, the time between the courses. I do uh, a buffet kind of appetizer. So people eat, they uh, mingle, they have a little vino, uh, back and forth. And I take my time for the next course, which would be the soup. And I don't overload them with the soup. And again, taking time in between talking, I think, helps a lot. Sort of uh, uh, digesting and uh, eating the right amount, if you will. Yeah, I'm a big believer in on Thanksgiving, I make a pot of escarole and white bean soup just to keep you from starving while you're working all day. Have it on the stove to sip on, nothing too heavy to sort of keep you going while you're cooking, and then you dive in on the main on the main dish. Yeah, I'm a big soup lover, and I think that soups are, are really not complicated. They're very forgiving. You can change, just don't oversalt it. Even if you oversalt it, you can add some water to it and uh, you know, so the soups are very forgiving. And, you know, if you have a recipe, like I have a big chapter on soups, you can also replace. I, I am perfectly fine with replacing. You know, you make bean and escarole, but okay, you can't find escarole. Uh, can you find chicory, bean and chicory, bean and Swiss chard? Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Absolutely. Um, another thing that I'm sort of interested in that's been, and I want to hear your perspective on, is I think about certain ingredients over the years that have started out being very cheap cuts of meat, like oxtails and brisket that have become popular and really, really expensive. Um, how, how have you experienced that? And are there any like ingredients that you love that are still cheap and you don't want to tell anybody about? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I know exactly what you were saying. Just when, uh, when we had it, at a good price and they were the best part, we knew the secret, but now everybody has discovered the secret. But still, you know, I, I go for, uh, um, uh, I go, I like bones. I like gelatinous bones for soups and all that. Uh, you know, you some beef bones, some chicken bones and mix that. So that's st still pretty, pretty reasonable. I like innards too. Uh, you know, that's a little maybe far-fetched. You know, I like tripe. I like cooking tripe. Uh, I like liver. Uh, I like, and I've been trying to sort of put it in the restaurants and put a recipe now and then in my book, rabbit. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great, great protein. We had rabbits. Grandma had rabbits. They make such a uh, uh, sense, you know, nutritional sense, they're lean, they're tasty, but also in the sense of, of our environment. They reproduce fast. They don't require that much food to grow. I mean, you know, in six to eight weeks, you have a, a full-grown rabbit that's ready to roast or to something. And all they ask for is grass. You know, I used to go and and grandma would send me out. They like clover. They, lo they love clover, the rabbits. So I used to go and uh, harvest the clover and bring it to them. So rabbit is another one. I'm looking for it all the time, and it's hard to find. If only they were uglier, I think we'd be able to make a larger market for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, and so another thing I think about, too, is, you know, you talk about um, you're a preserver of of culture, and um, and I, you know, from a recipe writing standpoint, you've written all these cookbooks. You know, how much personal? There's obviously personal taste that makes that that as the difference. You know, every in Italy, you can go anywhere, and from town to town, from home to home, people make a, a ragu bolognese differently, or, or or any kind of a meat sauce for that matter. Um, how much of your I think you are maybe being a little bit too modest in saying you're a preserver of culture, which is true, but there also is obviously you have, you must have immaculate tastes to be able to prepare these in a way that everyone seems to agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I have my little uh, uh, amendments, if you will, to traditional, but also I still go back to Italy and travel up and down, always searching. And when, you, when you're going to sort of searching for new recipe or new products or whatever, there's not that you're gonna find so much new, but you see little nuances. And these women or men or whoever's cooking, they don't give you a recipe. You're there, you're looking, you're, you're watching, and then you come uh, home. I come home and then I try to duplicate it. And of course it has my imprint on it. I mean, 
one of the things uh, uh, remark is the, my use of pepperoncino. Now, pepperoncino, red crushed pepper, uh, it's uh, a southern Italian uh, uh, widely used product. In the north of Italy, we use black pepper. You know, the Venetian trade, the Serenissima, and the Venetian trades of the spices brought because pepper is a tropical kind of in the tropical zone. So, but it was uh, a spice much appreciated. It uh, really made the, the Venetian empire sort of prosper. And so we use a lot of black pepper up there, but I don't, I like pepperoncino. And so I put pepperoncino when I make a polenta dish. Now polenta is very Nordic. So I do make those kind of uh, sort of, uh, you know, Lydia's uh, markings on the recipes. One of my favorite things to think about, and I get very fascinated by very simple dishes that can sort of be made in an infinite number of ways. And I think a lot about a basic pasta with tomato sauce. And even when I make it myself, I have the way that I've made it various points. And you always kind of just modify. Do you have a set way of making something like that? Or is it constantly uh, an improvisation in your head, even with such minor little differences in a dish like that? Well, there is a basic recipe, uh, you know, uh, you make a marinara, you need some olive oil, some garlic, some plum tomato, some marzano, you crush them, a little fresh basil, and you got yourself a marinara in 20 minutes. I mean, how hard can, but given that, every single one of those items can vary. You know, the tomatoes uh, are the biggest variant there, you know. So when I'm cooking and uh, I look for my San Marzano tomatoes, the plums, I taste it. Sometimes, you know, because uh, tomatoes are like wine, yearly pr produced. I, I mean, they produce it two, three times a year, but it's always different. The sun, the amount of sugar, the acidity. And so you have to taste along the way, no matter how, uh, much you cook and how much of an expert you are tasting and putting it in balance and putting it in what at the time, you know, for you are your taste levels. This should be tasting like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's never the same. Let's put it that way, Noah. Well, and even you think about like the way you treat the garlic, some people put it in whole, some people slice it, some people chop it, some people take it out before they, you know, finish the sauce. And there's, uh -huh. and there's all these little ways, you know, my mom would put a little handful of, of chopped parsley at the very end. And, you know, yeah. how you do you crush the tomatoes? Do you food mill them? Do you blend them? You know, and all these little variations are so uh, kind of uh, fun. And it's sort of, it's, it's like a, an infinity rabbit hole. I can sort of make, tomato sauce every day for my entire life and be happy with the smallest of changes. <laughs> That's right. So all of those people, all of you out there looking at all that, if it doesn't, it's the same every time. Or if there's a little variation, taste, go in there, adjust it. You know, uh, what I tell people is that uh, our, our, our sort of sensory apparatus, if you will, that collects all this information, and it's very important. So, and we store all this information, flavors, the smells and all of that. So when, when we're cooking, you know, these flavors are back and they're coming out. Uh, you know, you know the tomato sauce is supposed to taste like, at least you like it like that. So you go back to your resources. Well, maybe a little bit more uh, of basil, maybe a little bit. So uh, trust, you know, the, the uh, out there, when you're cooking, trust yourself, your taste, because you have built the library of flavors in your lifetime that you have. You have story, you have your library, your volumes of flavors and taste that you tasted along the way, spices, uh, herbs, the rosemary, you know all of that. Uh, and uh, sometimes when you continue to taste, you sense if something is missing or not, and you, your library will tell you that, and then you can adjust it. Um. Yeah, absolutely. It's cooking is alive and the ingredients were alive and there's always small changes in them. So you have to, if you only follow a recipe exactly, you're not really cooking, I sort of like to think. Um, so one thing I think about interestingly to me is, you know, uh, is my barbecue mentor is a guy named Kevin Bloodsoe, who's a highly acclaimed uh, pit master from Compton, California. And um, he said that one of the biggest accomplishments for him when he was learning how to cook and making brisket 
was when he finally made a brisket that his grandmother, who taught him <laughs> barbecue, approved of. So uh, as you are now a grandmother, um, are there people... I'm sure there are people in your family who seek your approval that you're willing to eat dishes that they make. Are there any examples of that, of members of your family, children or grandchildren who can, who have things they know they can make that you will actually be willing to eat for lunch or dinner? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they do. They take pride, actually. Uh, and if they're sort of lost halfway in between, they call me, Grandma. What's next? What do I do here? And I just love that. I love that they want sort of a guidance to, to something that they remember. They have in their library and they want to reach it. How do they reach it? So, uh, yes, and I enjoy that. I enjoy, but I also enjoy, you know, uh, when they do a little innovation, you know, uh, us Italian don't use much ginger, although I like it. Uh, my kids, of course, they like the the the, the ginger, the, the Japanese, the soup, all of that stuff, and they incorporate it in some of the cookings that they're doing, and they they look at me for my approval, and I think it's wonderful that they are sort of expanding their horizons in this new world that they live in. Uh, one thing that was a recurring theme in your uh, in your memoir was. You talked a lot about coffee and the smells of coffee and espressos and macchiatos. And uh, how young did you start drinking coffee? It seemed like you were five years old and you were already drinking coffee and, and <laughs> growing up. Yeah, coffee is uh, a, a, a taste, an element uh, in, in the Italian uh, lifestyle that it's absolutely necessary. It, it, uh, uh, it's part of, I think, who we are, it's part of our of that library. It's a big section in our library, if you will. So just walking down the street in Italy, uh, there's coffee wafting. And you know, when I get to Italy, that's one of the first things that I smell, you know, when even at the airports and whatever. And I love it. Now coffee again, it's it's a, an element uh, that is not grown in Italy. Uh, it's expensive. And it's I guess it was one of those special treats that Italians, because I think coffee first came through Venice, Trieste, there was a free port, and then went up to Vienna and to Paris. So in that area that, that I come from, coffee is, 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 uh, has really made a mark. Italy, the big coffee producer, comes from Trieste, the same area that, that we come from. And uh, uh, I think for me, the smell, the aroma of coffee is almost like perfume, but it sort of gives me a positive vibe. Um, another thing that is really kind of fascinating to me in, in your story, and it tells a story of a larger part of America, too, is, you know, you talked about how you didn't realize until you started meeting other chefs once you'd opened restaurants that that there weren't very many women in your position. And even now, I still talk to chefs who uh, are women who had never worked for a female head chef in their entire careers and not until they became one and hired kitchens that were more filled with women. Um, what is that sort of, what are you seeing in, in how that marketplace, not marketplace, but that career landscape has has changed and evolved or not changed? And 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 you were such a inadvertent, I think, at first trailblazer in that. Um, and how do you, how, how does that strike you now? Oh, I love it. I love seeing women because I think women in the kitchen just belong. Uh, and going back to my, uh, uh, again, growing up, women were in the kitchen, whether it was my grandmother, whether somebody else's mother, you go, we went to the restaurants or hosterias or trattorias. The women were in the kitchen. The men were out there pouring wine and being the hosts. But, you know, who were the chefs? Women. Until to this day, you go in trattorias all over Italy, and you will find most likely a woman in the kitchen. And actually, you look forward in finding a woman in the kitchen that can really cook that regional food. Uh, that's the beginning. But then uh, uh, chef, uh, being a chef became a profession. And then men sort of took it over. They, they professed in it. They really invented. They got new. And of course, going back to the French, because the restaurants as a restaurant is a tough industry. It's a tough industry 
uh, especially for women, for women that intend to have family, that have families. You know, when the restaurant is underneath and you live on top and there's grandma on the side, it's easier to be a woman chef because you have, you know, the whole support of the family. But today that's not the case. So it, it's a woman really that decides to go into this profession. Uh, uh, she's passionate and she loves it. She has to make a commitment and it's not easy. And uh, I'm glad that the doors are opening in every way, in compensation, in benefits, and in the opportunity of women actually opening their restaurants and being the leaders of their restaurants and be hiring other women or men or whomever. You know, my case was where uh, my husband and I opened to this, so it wasn't, I ended up in the kitchen. He was outside, you know, typical Italian sort of combo. But uh, for me, maybe it was a bit easier because it was a real family uh, run uh, restaurant. And I had my mother who lived with me. So when I had the children, she helped. Them. So I kind of carried on the tradition of Italy. For me, it was a little easier, but it's not easy for women to get into our industry. And I am delighted and glad that uh, they're really forging ahead. Absolutely. Um, and now as we uh, continue along, I want to talk about your book again, because it's such an exciting thing. Uh, if, uh, do you, if just off the top of your head, do you have a particular recipe that comes to mind as one that you would be the most excited if you were going to cook one for dinner or that I could cook for dinner tomorrow? Are there well, certain things that really stand out to you that make you excited? Well, there's quite a few. You know, I particularly like the the the, the meats and in the oven preparation where I take a whole tray and uh, you put on the tray the vegetables, the potatoes and then the meat and again it's a question of timing you know if you put the pork chops then you put them together with the potatoes uh, the broccoli you kind of put a little clusters bigger because they take a little longer so all of that timing issues that I was taking talking about you need to pay attention or on the same tray you want to put salmon well you put all the vegetables potatoes and all that first you pull it out when it's three quarters done you move over the vegetables and put pieces of salmon back in the oven. So I really like that kind of cooking. And, you know, like a big tray uh, with everything nice and crispy, kind of vegetables and everything on a big tray on the table. That's so inviting. But, Noah, the, the, the dish that I really want everybody to pay attention is that one pot lasagna. You know, Noah, I said, okay, so I want to make it easier for the people out there. Uh, and this pre-cooked pasta, you know, the, an Italian chef woman here, uh, you know, always makes a fresh pasta for her lasagna. But I said, I am going to try it and I am going to experiment. So I went out, I bought the pre-cooked pasta and I made the one pan lasagna, 40 minutes, it was done, it was delicious. So I take great pride in actually uh, using this pre-cooked pasta to really facilitate and make uh, uh, the, the viewers out there be able to make a lasagna, which everybody loves, is such a comfort food, in 40 minutes without making the pasta. And you know what? It came out very good. I want you to try it, okay? I'll try that out. Uh, it's funny, they, there's a real focus in this book of, of, you know, the importance of getting people just to cook. And you talk in the beginning, too, about how to use an Instant Pot. Um, and there's so many home cooks have Instant Pot now, pots now, and you have directions for how to modify the recipes if you have an Instant Pot at home. Uh, what was that like for you um, beginning to, how, how long have you sort of been learning about that process? You know, I, I don't use a lot of technology. I'm really basic what I like in the kitchen. And I, I kind of control it with timing. But if you're in a pinch, you know, pressure cooker, I used for beans, for soups, and all of that. So it is a great convenience. And, uh, uh, you know, today people use it and have it. So I made that connection between one pot cooking regular time and an instant pot cooking. Uh, getting. Do you get the same results? Uh, very close. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of your favorite, one of, sorry, my favorite of your cookbooks is um, Lydia Cooks from the Heart of Italy. And it was one of the early cookbooks for me that I really started to understand 
the geography of Italy and the way that food changes in different regions, the way you'd say, look at America and how big it is that, that there's food in New Orleans is very different from food in, in, in uh, like California and things like that. But obviously it's much more uh, ingrained culturally in Italy. And you know, learning about you know the cuisine of Alto Adige and being able to the idea of like you know beer braising and things like that, which you don't sure. naturally think of with Italian cooking growing up in America. Um, are there any regions of Italy and cuisines that you think uh, haven't made it across to the American uh, restaurant scene yet that you think would be really exciting to to open people's eyes up to? Well, you know, Italy has twenty regions. And Italy as a country, it's smaller than California. So, you know, 20 regions sounds like a lot. There's uh, one of the biggest uh, repertoire of recipes, and yet it's a small country, but it is so diverse. And uh, the topography is one of the elements that really makes each region so different. They have, you know, the Alps up north, and then the Apennines going down like the backbone, down the, the, the whole boot. And those situations with the oceans all around it create a lot of microclimates. And that's why Italy has all these wonderful products because uh, the Italians, the farmers, really know how to uh, make the best out of their different microclimates. And, uh, but not only that, you know, Italy has the influences, all the different invasions and the, the uh, regions really reflect that. You go down to Sicily, Moorish, Spanish, you go down to Puglia, uh, more on the Greek side, uh, Mediterranean, very. you go up to Piemonte, Valdosta, very French, you go where I am, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, very Austrian. And uh, because it's Slavic, because the Austrian-Hungarian Empire ruled there for a period of time, and so on. All of these uh, really influence. We we cook as you notice. Know, we cook with sauerkraut. With I make spetzels. I make polenta. I uh, all of these things that goulash, palacinke, uh, 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 strudel. You know these are these. We'll say are these Italians. Yes. They're Italian, but they're from the influence of that border. So if I were to say which region has not really reached that really, I think, you know, uh, I did somewhat the Friuli Venezia Giulia region, but I think it could use more. Um, I think, uh, uh, let's see what else. I would like to see more of Liguria, also a very herbal kind of, uh, it's a sliver of, of land right on, on the sea there. Um, Sardinia. Sardinia is, a, is a, a, a big sort of island. It's the biggest island. And it's, even though it's an island, it's a very uh, in, inland cooking, lambs and all of that, because uh, of, the, of the different pirates. So the, the Sardinians would gather in, inland rather than stay on the coast. And also malaria and the um, uh, the uh, on this on the coast would, would so they would so it's interesting that you have this beautiful island, big island, and what what the food is basically lamb, uh, goat uh, cheese, goats, uh, and all of that, and a lot of uh, uh, bread, uh, cr uh, sort of uh, eastern bread, sort of Middle East. Eastern bread and all of that, and that's the influence. So Italy is still yet a lot to be discovered and to be brought over. I think it's coming. Yeah, it's, uh, and so one of the things that, you know, your involvement in bringing Italy to America is the ability to start allowing people to source some of the ingredients in a more accessible way that weren't available um, otherwise. Um, are there any ingredients that are uh, native to Italy that you're fighting to find a way to get over here uh, that you have not been able to successfully? Well, I think the ones that have lately been, uh, and I think that they're, uh, they're allowed in if they are produced or the nanduia, you know, nanduia, or uh, colatura di, 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 di alici, which is, uh, the you know, when you make anchovies, you put the salt and they put the weight on, there is a drainage, and that's colatura di pesce. It's like the Chinese fish sauce. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that's sort of coming. 
And uh, I, I think that, you know, um, Italy has, uh, this, the small producer have really um, promoted, Italy was good in promoting. And I think that certainly with our stores, Italy, we have um, uh, 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 an opportunity to do just that because one of the premises and why I got involved, we got involved as a family was that um, this Oscar Farinetti, who is the founder, uh, really connected with the slow food movement with Petrini. And uh, what really uh, uh, excited me was precisely that, that the small producers that were doing still traditional food were being given an opportunity to sell their products and to bring them to the United States. You know, uh, the, 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 um, the bad part, I think, of, of the food industry is when big industry gets involved and they just take over and do their own formulas. We need to respect and revive it. I think there's such a great movement here in the States with the farmers and all of that. We need to support them. We need to buy their stuff because that's what real food is all about. One of my favorite things that I've only had in Italy was I was in Norcia in Umbria once and had the prosciutto di Norcia. And it's uh, a very unique uh, and delicious prosciutto that I think there's just not enough to even bother to export. <laughs> you talk, you're talking about the guanciale, the the, 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 prosciutto, the, uh, prosci the prosciutto di Norcia, which I guess they use only. The prosciutto di Norcia is is made out of um, uh, the the boar, boar mm -hmm. prosciuttos and boar sausages and boar salami, and yeah, yeah, there's there's not that much that they could, uh, but they also, there's, they make prosciutto out of uh, goat's uh, hind legs, you know, oh, wow. and that's up, up in, in Piemonte, in the Alps, uh, and that's not being imported. It's because, you know, there's not that much on it. It's really, you know, how much is anybody first willing to, to, to eat it and taste it and pay for it? So we're getting close to the end, so I'm going to ask you a very controversial question. I hope you'll, you'll give me a straight answer. There are many styles of pizza. There is New York style pizza. There is the more artisanal California, like Nancy Silverton style. You have uh, pizza de Napoli, you have Neapolitan pizza. You have uh, a, a Tonda style in Rome. You have the big thicker crust styles in Rome. What's, according to your personal taste and preference, what is the best style of pizza? Well, I'll zero it down uh, to three Italian style. Uh, there's the Not pizza in Napoli. Well, no, I'll come back. To, I'll come back to the states. There's people. Uh, there's pizza napoletana, which is the pizza with the uh, the thick uh, sort of border, and it's wet inside. It's you know, it's not that crispy. Then there's the Roman style, which is thin. Uh, and well crisp uh, underneath. I, I happen to like that one. And then there's the Sicilian style, which is the, the high, the thick one, without cheese. Usually they put uh, oregano, tomato, anchovies, and sometimes olives. Uh, so, so uh, you know, it, they're different. Uh, and from then, everything else, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, it's born from there. Uh, you know, uh, Nancy Silverton, we're partners uh, in La Mozza and all of that. I love her. I mean, th I think she's a genius with dough. But there's so many good pizzas that are coming around in the United States. People are really respecting the 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 rising, the ra raising of the, the dough, the slow, the cold, the fermentation. And uh, because, you know, pizza is so simple. You know, it's flour and water and a little bit of yeast. That's the basis of it. You have to give it time. For, you have to give it time for those flavors to develop. And then, of course, the topic, not overdoing it, you know, and having good tomatoes and good cheese and whatever else you want to put it on. But there's some good pizzas in the United States now. Absolutely. I want to take it for an assumption that you think the Roman thin crust is the best. <laughs> Well, I, you know, I know I like I like the Neapolitan, I, I, and I do, but uh, uh, I like them all, Noah, at different times. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, I see Elaine popping in. Does that mean that I've uh, we've we've reached the end of our of our question and answer section? 
Well, I could go on for a couple more hours if that would be okay with everyone. But uh, this is absolutely delightful. Thank you both so much. I feel that I learned so much and uh, so much about Italy, so much about America. Uh, I hope that everyone will put on the calendar uh, the 14th of December. Uh, I think it's at nine o'clock in the east and six o'clock in the west and uh, seven o'clock in between because it's a special. Lydia celebrates America and where she goes to American chefs, American homes, people who've sometimes had against the odds. In fact, uh, I think the subtitle of that show is Overcoming the Odds. Uh, I am going to be watching that. I hope everyone will, as well as the TV series of uh, that Lydia has now, uh, Lydia's Home Cooking. Uh, but it, and to go with seeing Lydia's Home Cooking, you absolutely have to have uh, the book that those of you who are uh, who are holding this at home or who are getting it uh, in the mail from Book Passage uh, are going to absolutely love. I can tell you there is just nothing like it. Uh, I always think cooking Italian style requires 15 different special things. Not with this. It's wonderful. And uh, I thank you, Lydia, for all you've done for us for so many years and all you've taught us. And to have you here with Noah is just really, really a treat. And I hope that if anyone is thinking of a great Christmas present, you will think of one of Lydia's many books, one of Noah's many books. I recently had the, the fun of uh, starting to cook from Noah's and uh, Jeremy Fox's book on vegetables. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, my daughter's a vegetarian. To be able to cook out of that book is just fantastic for me. And uh, I'm looking forward to we have that book in stock with other books of both Lydia and Noah, but I'm looking forward to April 5th, uh, 2022, when Don't Panic Pantry is going to come, come out from Noah, his, uh, his newest cookbook. And to all of you who are with us tonight, thank you so much. Uh, come by uh, or to either the Ferry Building or Corte Madera uh, and uh, or on our website, bookpassage.com, and get your copy, an extra copy, because I know a lot of you already have it, and everyone who gets one from us is going to have a signed book plate, which Lydia was so gracious to take the time to sign all those book plates. Uh, and I, I really just appreciate both of you so much, and Denise Lucy for making all of this possible, and to the Bank of Moran who sponsored this event. Uh, we'll see you in the spring when we'll have a new Dominican event uh, schedule. And in the meantime, please look at bookpassage.com to see what's going on with events now. With huge thanks to both Noah and Lydia. Uh, this was a very, very special evening. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. And thank you, Lydia. It was an honor and a pleasure to talk to you tonight. Thank you, Noah. Great questions. Thank you, Elaine, for this opportunity. And uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of us, all of you, and good cooking. I'm gonna try that uh, that one bowl lasagna, that one pot lasagna. That's my next one. <laughs> let let me know.